morning. We have to coordinate. With oh, we used to. We used to. But then you went saying. off script. Yeah, there's a script. Right there's a script. No. Good morning to all Hello. of you. Hello. How is we everyone? Okay, so. Robots. We robots. Did. Teaching robots. We did. Teaching robots. Oh, he's on mute. <laughs> You're on mute. <laughs> um, so we did toddler trick-or-treating yesterday. What did you do? Did you have by, fun? By which we mean we assisted toddlers in trick-or-treating, <laughs> not that we dressed up as toddlers. We totally to should have dressed up as our kids. Would they would have been like, bad idea. Dad! <laughs> so what did you do? Was it good? Did you have a good time? I have to tell you that like just getting out and seeing people and doing things that kind of like felt like a few years ago felt really good for me. <laughs> How about you? I watched a horror movie with friends. Yay! Oh, Fire Ants. <laughs> That's actually if you're gonna watch it with friends, Fire Ants is definitely the best. Oh, okay. Candy 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 very good. Candy 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 where I got up at 5 o'clock and went about my things. And I several times thought, you know, that's weird. I usually see them an hour late at 6 o'clock. And I came home and I told my dad that I was just going to come out. And he said, it was 6 a.m. Yeah. And I was like, ah! Yeah. But you. But you. I, I, you know, I bet you that most people civilized in the world do not plan to wake up at hey, 5. Hey, school, we got these systems. Okay. But, like, maybe. And something's at 5 o'clock. <laughs> still have an hour only like 200 that's why we're kind of slowing things down because it's taking like people a little while to come in and that's fine it's middle of the semester oh here wait what if we did that is that better is that better testing testing okay 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 Maybe that's better. Okay. How about that? Are we good? Are we still muted? I think we're still muted. Are we muted? No, we're not muted. Okay. Wonderful. Welcome. Uh, the Fox is delightful. We will be screenshotting it in uh, just a second. Um, and uh, how how is everyone? We hope you're okay. We hope that you had a total Halloween break that felt amazing. Uh, today, what are we doing today? Today we are wrapping up the college. No, first of all, I think legitimately we're saying to everyone who is affected by the Bell Canada oh, thing, yeah. you are not going crazy. No. You are going crazy with other people. <laughs> Collectively. And we're just thinking about how manipulable the little technology that you think of, uh, we feel as so intimate, is actually just yeah. adjustable by Ma Bell or by Ma Google or by Ma Apple. Yeah. Ma Apple. Um, so you're all fine. The time okay. is fine. Time, time is fine. not relative. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, okay. Wonderful. What Let's... did our kids go trick or treating as? Ooh. Okay. So Jack was a, a superhero, uh, of his own making Yep. because that's Jack. Yep, and, and he's very good. He, Daniel. He had to incorporate a, a M95 into yeah. the costume, and he did, and yeah. it was actually pretty cool. He did it really well. And then Daniel was a dragon. With a tiger mask. With a tiger mask. <laughs> and when asked at the doorsteps of people on our street, what are you? Each of them said, I'm Daniel. Or, I'm Jack. Jack. And it's like... <laughs> and they were like, yes, okay, fine. <laughs> Literally, what are you? Okay. So, wonderful. Um, the fox just keeps on getting better and better, uh, and I kind of don't want to... No, I've already screen grabbed. You've already screen grabbed. <laughs> screen grabbed again. It's, it's great. Do it again. Do it again. Hold on. Yeah. That means I have to fight with Zoom. Okay. All right, Zoom. You don't like me. So... I don't like you. uh -huh. Here we go. Oh, it is splendid. It's splendid. Okay. Wonderful. I got very different. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna redo a Twitter poll oh, that I did oh. on the foxes because I got 
like unwavering suggestions from you guys as to which fox video fox kit fox den yeah. video to submit to that contest and twitter i didn't do a good poll I sh i'm going to change it how i did it uh i'm going to do it again today but those that did participate last week on the twitterverse suggested completely different uh, oh my goodness but i like your strategy yeah all of your strategies yeah 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 there we go. Okay, good. Let's get going. I think most of you who usually come are, oh, no, you're still coming in. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to clear. Okay. Here we go. Yay. Okay, so we're wrapping up Apology. <laughs> I dressed as a comfy person in bread marathoning shows good <laughs> costume okay we're gonna wrap up ecology and uh so for the so the logistical stuff for the purposes of the next topic test it ends here okay well it ends in 40 minutes 40 minutes yeah. today this is the last of the ecology unit and we will have a topic test on ecology okay that's coming up i believe on the 12th double check please always keep using that course calendar to keep you on track, okay? Um, and uh, what else? I think we are ready to kind of wrap things up. Remember, though, that we always bring the next topic with us, okay? Um, so when we think about ecology, we have to think about evolution. When we're moving into physiology, we have to think about all of the other, the other two, okay? Um, so just kind of remember um that all of these things are not discrete silos of biology that you have to integrate them that's why we call our department integrative biology yeah it was a bad name when we thought about calling ourselves silos of biology <laughs> and we realized yeah. that's kind of what we already were doing it didn't test well with the peeps <laughs> Okay, so, um, yeah, integrative biology means that we always think about these different topics and how they affect it, um, because sometimes the answer to your question isn't within the domain that you're looking, right? So, you know, if you have a hammer, there's that, that saying, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? So you want to try to not pick your tools first when you answer Has questions. Has anyone ever statistically tested that saying? Because I bet you everyone here has a hammer. Does everything look like a nail to you? <laughs> no. Or is it only when you're holding it going, oh, God, What can God. I bang? Yeah, okay. Or it looks like perfectly plastered drywall that really needs a hole. Yeah. Okay. But it's certainly true. The, the tool bias that people <laughs> yeah. experience is bananas. Absolutely, right? Okay, good. So here is taking up the homework. Woohoo! Woohoo! There you go. <laughs> All the card. They're working. So now's the time for me to sing. No. Did you make me another coffee? I did not. Oh, oh dear. If you try and do that, I'm going to throw you out the window. Okay, a few more seconds.
Okay, shall we take up the homework? Yeah, let's take up the homework, right? Okay, good. Um, and we'll end the poll 78%. That's not bad, actually, for like a post-Halloween kind of kind of participation rate. It's kind of... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> there we go. We'll share the results. So 48% of you were correct. Well done. Okay. Um, what we want uh, to do is kind of celebrate the... <laughs> abundance of information that you can infer from a food web. Do you want to? Pardon? What are we celebrating? Woo! Woo! What? The <laughs> abundance of information that you can infer from a food web. Okay. As long as I can bring to this celebration, my buddy, the celebration of everything that's hidden in a black box in the food web. Amazing. Okay. So right. start out. Let's okay. get into the celebrate the abundance. Let's wait, wait, wait. Do we have... Oh! <laughs> it's like we thought about it. <laughs> okay. Um, this... <laughs> So um, lots and lots of things can be inferred, right? Um, and this is really where, uh, you know, pow like where you go from like using a food web to go what eats what, which is kind of like, I, you know, it's not like who eats whom, who eats whom. <laughs> it, it's, it's nice. It's, it's accurate information and it can get a lot more cool than that. And Would like, that it were so simple. It's complicated. So Basically, what you want to do is you want to play around with these types of things, okay? So looking at this food web and looking at zooplankton, first of all, is that like one species of zooplankton? No, it's many. Phyla, 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 phyla. <laughs> okay, so lots and lots of different species and phyla of zooplankton are in there, okay? So when we... Talk about introducing one predator, one new predator into this food web. Is it likely that they are going to cause a collapse of the zooplankton community? No. So the other reason is because even if it was one species, the number of connections there, the number of things that eat it is so big that you can infer that the population or the community size in this case um, is going to be huge, right? It's going to be ginormous. So, it's Which is a specific ecological term. Ginormous. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very unlikely that the introduction of one more, like if there was only one other species that ate it, and you introduced like a full-on competitor, um, then yeah, you might you might be super worried, right? So if you introduced, if you went out and said, I've got a bazillion, which is another ecological term, dollars from NSERC to buy starfish, and I'm going to put starfish into the system. If you're a clam, you're like, whoa, 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 <laughs> let's think about this. <laughs> Right. Um, but zooplankton, just because of all of those connections, you can use those connections to infer that the population or the community size is going to be like humongous. Okay. Um, and then the problem is that if we look at phytoplankton and zooplankton, there's only one, one arrow and it should be like 25, 30, 40, 50 arrows, right? Coming from zooplankton. Um, so we have to remember this whole idea of these biases towards vertebrate representation on food webs um, when we start making all sorts of inferences. Who's the guy with the arrows, the useless one from the Avengers? The arrow? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. Tell me in the... It's, so the, like yeah, it's sad, not the arrow. Sad guy. Sad guy from... Okay. He's got a show soon. Anyhow, think of him with all the arrows. Right. The more arrows, the more resilience. That's right. Hawkeye, thank you. There we you. go. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And yes, people are asking, I'm sorry, adult cod, you are reading that correctly. Adult cod eat juvenile cod. And yeah. That's, remember we talked about the resilience that many species, evolution has kind of uncovered and reinforced in many species where a juvenile and an adult will begin to partition and eat different things. We talked about that in, in um, I, I guess, last Wednesday. Yeah. 
and it happens like you you know like huge examples like tadpoles and adult frogs or caterpillars and adults butterflies and moths but sometimes for many species uh a really abundant food source is really abundant juveniles yeah yeah <laughs> great okay so um if we're gonna add juvenile cod though taking a look um at uh their relationship um, to other things. We take a look at crab, for example. So juvenile cod are eating crab. And the only other, uh, there are two other species. There's adult cod and there's humans that are eating crab as well. So this is a fairly simple kind of relationship. Um, and since in our collapsed ecosystem there aren't any adult cod, it's really only a competition with humans for the moment, uh, which could have an impact on uh, the population size of crab. And again, this is probably not just one species, but multiple species. Um, and that, of course, in a human context, has an effect on market price. So that's how we get to that. A lot of you got there, which is fantastic. Um, similarly, we can get there with shrimp, um, recognizing that, you know, silver hake are still in the picture. But again, it's pretty it's pretty simple, um, and so we can start to make inferences about how that would affect the population and the availability of those uh, resources for economic human development. Great. Okay. I hope so that's... So there's a great uh, observation in the chat that I was just uh, trying to type to, and when I sent it away, what I was saying was people uh, were asking about... Uh, um, kelp and sea urchins, and I expanded it to think about starfish and other things. <coughs> Meaning that in some cases, and I've said this in the chat, there are taxa that have single taxa that can have a disproportionately large effect on the rest of the food web. And what we started to do in the 1970s and 80s is to, in some cases, talk about keystone taxa or keystone species, ones whose presence or absence in a system or changes in their abundance can have a disproportionately large effect. Yep. And it's not saying for sure that if we introduce juvenile cod into this food web, they are going to be able to establish themselves. That's right. So if you remember, and this is kind of like the buzzkill of what actually happened, there are a whole bunch of things that could plausibly happen, right? Given their biology, natural history, and all of those things. Wait and a second. Will it depend? It will depend. Oh, no. So Again? Yeah. So one of the things that we've noticed on the Grand Banks nowadays, now that cod fishing has been dramatically reduced, if not completely, like, halted, um, is everybody's like, oh, great, cod will come back. That'll be, that'll be a thing. And in, like, a, a generation or two, we'll be able to reinitiate or reinvigorate the, the cod fishery again. It's not, it's not always like that, because if you remember, you can change you. A species can change its realized niche depending upon the circumstances. Just like the gray seals, when there was a reduction in the amount of cod, changed their niche to focus on smaller fish as part of their diet. If you remove something, other things can change their niche and kind of fill in holes and gaps. And that seems to be what has happened on the Grand Banks. Now, we get shit wrong all the time. So... As of right now, it does look like there are other things that have taken over, um, including, I think it's squid, is a dominant predator um, in the Grand Banks and has kind of shifted a little bit more closely into the adult cod space, which is making it difficult for adult cod to establish themselves within the food web. Um, so this may really be a changeover and a, a massive like loss uh, due to us. And this is, this fishery, this effect, this change, these kinds of changes, these recalibrations of food webs are super common all over the world, particularly in marine environments where with fisheries, one of the things we're very good as fishers is stripping yeah. the, the world of a particular species or a particular age class of a species. And so if you're interested in fisheries, one of the things as a fisheries biologist you might have to be good at is understanding the uh, biology of jellyfish because globally it's often jellyfish that replace this niche and they can be so abundant and so otherwise ephemeral to our eyes that we are very can we don't have great ways to deal with jellyfish 
Interesting, right? Okay. So lots and lots of important contributions to make in that world. And the connections and the sort of complexity of it is delightful. Your brain will be engaged for an entire career because <laughs> there are all sorts of things. Um, and obviously a deep connection to, to humans. Okay. And we're done. Oh. <laughs> no, we're just going to change topics now. Hey, speaking of cod. Hog? Hog. <laughs> weed no <laughs> squirrel squirrel <laughs> okay so let's uh kind of finish up thinking a little bit about our uh wood lots uh and which one we are going to bulldoze if we have to bulldoze one um and uh the last thing we want to do is introduce to you the idea of invasive species smith has some feelings about invasive species have, that i'm sure he'll want to share <laughs> Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so uh, also a public service announcement, because we have the opportunity to talk to hundreds of, of students, some of you coming to Guelph for the first time, some of you never knowing or encountering giant hogweed before. And so I feel like by keeping this in, it may not only serve an important pedagogical <laughs> service, but it may also help uh, save lives save and you. injury. So giant hogweed, do not touch it. Um, and at, right, actually, we, we very rarely say write that down. Write that write down. Write that down. <laughs> yeah. Um, if, uh, if you're into um, uh, sci-fi and uh, B books, um, this is like the real incarnation of the Triffid. Um, this <laughs> so wait, if you're into sci-fi and like old. Old school. Old, like, yeah. And if you haven't and you like that stuff, read The Day of the Triffids. It is amazing. Okay. So. Um, do not touch them ever because they have this phytophotochemical um, that when you touch them, uh, actually it's kind of similar to poison ivy, which is also phytophoto, but, um, or photophyto. I don't know which one it is. Native, native. <laughs> but, um, but basically, uh, if you get their, their resin or their sap on you, uh, and then uh, especially in the context of, of, of sunlight, um, it will leave a burn, but but poison ivy is one thing. Um, this is a completely different thing that can do all sorts of real damage, and it's an invasive species. So where did it come from? Doesn't say on the slide. Where did it come from? Um, outer space. Outer I space. No, I think it came on when ships. No. When I was no? younger, just a bad um, kid. South there we Asia. go. South, South Asia. Asia. Yeah. Okay. Came on ships, I believe. Um, spaceships, I presume. Spaceships, and it's done some major damage to our ecosystems because it takes over, um, but also it can do actual damage to you. And good points in the uh, in the chat. That's right. Uh, same thing with poison ivy. Your pets can also carry this chemical. That's right. So if they've been running through it, give yeah. them a wash. Yeah, and they're very, very tall, so they just kind of block out the sun for a whole bunch of things. So we do research on giant hogweed. Ooh, someone's touched um, it. Yeah. Oh, just like if you do wash with soap and water, like right away. Um, in the dark. Yeah. Um, so this is what giant hogweed can look like later in the season. So it is very tall. Um, there's a there's a student uh, researcher uh, there. So just be really, really careful. This is what it looks like. Of course, it can be shorter. So don't just like look up all the time. <laughs> And don't do this. Um, this is a student that is touching it. Don't touch it. And don't ever be in your later career the supervisor or the mentor or the whatever of someone who's employed by you and then take a picture as they're doing this because there shouldn't have been a picture of this moment. No, this was the beginning of a painful, painful period in this person's life. This was life. not us. No. We just like to put in the disclaimer. That's right. Because... All of our students didn't touch it. <laughs> yeah. Um, because it can leave blisters and terrible things on your fingers and hands, um, or wherever it touches and like serious blistering that's this is, very should, painful. Maybe we should put a trigger warning. There's a lot of people that are like, ah, ah don't touch. Don't touch. Don't touch. <laughs> Yellow okay, shirt guy. Good. What are you so, doing? Imagine giant hogweed is found in North Campus Ravine. Okay. Flame you got it. it? <laughs> <laughs> like don't don't we're just introducing okay, right. more information about the woodlots that they can then decide <laughs> okay so first of all before we decide which one we're fine this is like the final moment 
Is there anything else that you still want to know about these three woodlots? Anything else that you need to know? Or do you feel like you have all of the information that you need in order to decide which one would be sold off for condo development? Yeah. Or whatever. Shopping mall. Anything else? Anything else? Any thoughts in the chat? Business. Uh, has anyone tried to get rid of them? We'll show what happened. Ooh, nice. Yes, you can get rid of uh, giant hogweed, and it's a really slow process. Oh, good question. So, a couple. So, which woodlot is least used by the public? Nice. The location related to people. Yep. Can we make a case not to clear any of them? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Do, Do we, we have, have to? <laughs> <laughs> what is the development potential of Brownswood versus North, North Campus? Campus? Yeah. These are good questions. These are really good questions. Make it a campsite campground. Well, Brownswoods, I, I feel like Brownswoods is pretty like vulnerable because it stops the creep of the buildings of University of Guelph. Like, yeah. if they bulldozed it, they could just keep on putting buildings along college, right? Um, is there going to be short answer on the topic test? I don't know yet. <laughs> we'll let you know. Um, uh, what else? Make it a campsite. Ooh, that's a good idea. Okay. Um, what else? What else? Okay. We use Brownswoods. We've got to carry the name over at least. Yeah. It's, Brownswoods, though, has some, like, historic stuff going on, too, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, so maybe there's like a like a sort of human heritage kind of perspective that will keep it there rather than get rid of it. Apparently there's a dog in the there's video. There's a dog in a video. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. So now remember do you remember what you voted the last time? If you remember what you voted the last time, what I would suggest is instead of just stamping, how about you use the, uh, in the draw, select an arrow and go from where you were to where you are now. And if you don't remember, just stamp. Which one, if you had to choose, which one would you develop? Do any of the woodlots have endangered species? Get the name of that person. <laughs> Super. Would developing the dairy bush where the field is make it an urban forest island? Yes, it would yes. reinforce what has already happened, which is that all of these are essentially urban forest islands. Yeah. Super. Okay. I like this. i got to grab this. Yeah, it's really good. So can I share some of the things that have happened with the dairy bush this year? Oh, please. Before we leave it with their thoughts. Yeah. Please, please, please. So for those of you, thank you for your voting. Yeah. Well done. And I want you, as future alumni of this university, and that is how this university will think of you mm -hmm. practically the moment, maybe even before you convocate, they will yes. they will approach you for money and they and then you have leverage. You already have leverage as students. You yeah. have the second most leverage you have is as alum. Um, remember these lots. I'm always disappointed when people leave here and they are, when asked by the university about the spaces that mean the most to them, they often come up with Johnson Green and the fields of Kentucky bluegrass in front of the, that building. That's great. And, and gathering for 420 or for like having <laughs> lovely things on Johnson Green is, is great. But think of these other spaces that are much more threatened and much more vulnerable because there are, as you saw, the, the, this, um, last uh, simulation wasn't a simulation in the in the last kind of online units that you've been doing there is a campus master plan it is revisited regularly these were real people that we were talking to in this unit and those campus master plans do have bits that they carve off and they develop and that particular field beside the dairy bush is one I, of i think the most vulnerable that will catastrophically affect the dairy bush you are here in as first year students, this is the third, normally what happens in that field, as you saw with maybe with Doug Larson, uh, when he and I were talking in the field, is it's cut, it gets mowed down. Three years ago, 
there was a very early snow and it didn't get cut. Last year with COVID, it didn't get cut. This year, they've agreed not to cut it. I'm going to keep pushing. This is me as an advocate and as a, as a activist. I'm going to keep, and as a scientist, I'm going to keep pushing for the natural experiment that they stop cutting the field because the thousands of trees that Larson talked about in your video, little tiny bonsai trees that are actually giant black walnut or old black walnut that get cut once a year. They're now big. They're taller than me. Um, so they're six, 10, 12 feet tall. And I think that is going to be an amazing legacy natural experiment uh, for this university is that is if the dairy bush is allowed to reseed that field, if the wind and the rodents of the dairy bush are allowed to take the seeds and the offspring of those trees and plant them there, I would love to come that you come back as alum and celebrate that. Absolutely. There I've never been as explicit about my, I made, we made this inquiry case eight years ago. Yeah. This has been a slow creep, slow creep, but I'm trying to seed the alum with people that are like, Dairy Bush and the field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause if not, like Smith explicit. is moving into the field. Yeah. <laughs> and it's hard. To, the trees are big, but they're not yet big enough for me to chain myself to. They, <laughs> they need to reap that critical status. Whereas if I climb it, I still like, it still falls over. <laughs> <laughs> it's not anyone shouting up going come down they like walk over and they're like get off the tree <laughs> <laughs> no okay <laughs> so let's kind of put our inquiry skills to use because one of the things that we're we're asking you to do is to think about or to be presented with an ecological pattern and to be able to apply some of the different hypotheses. If you remember, we gave you about five of them, uh, five different ways that species can be where they are or not where they aren't, um, and some of the ways that you might go about testing that, right? So um, we kind of bring you back to this big ecological um, like pattern around the planet with the biomes. Um, and you can see that for the most part, you know, biomes are very much related to latitude as well as to elevation. So remember, there are two variables that can be used to divide up these different biomes. What are they? Temperature and precipitation. <laughs> okay, so um, temperature and precipitation, that's it. Um, and then, of course, as we get sort of more and more refined or we zoom in, a lot of the biological factors become important. Um, and then as we get like super zoomy, um, some of those abiotic factors kind of drift away, right? You know, the difference between the dairy bush and brownswood is not going to be precipitation. Um, and so they kind of have this like beautiful little balance of importance or not importance, depending upon the scale. Um, thinking about biogeographical regions, this is bigger than biomes, which is, I, you know, there are reasons to have them. And then there are like, it's, there's so much within each of them. But if, if we wanted to, we could merge the biomes into biogeographical regions. Um, and it becomes really helpful, um, when we think about the history of our planet and the history of life on the planet, I think, is like the scale at which, right? Like we're not going to, um, you know, launch a study uh, in Spain um, and apply the results to uh, an island in Japan, right? Like there's just so much going on that's different there, even though they are part of the same biogeographical region. Um, but it does help us understand the history of evolution and the relationships that things might have. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we do it. And I just wanted to point out the the knee and the paley and all of those we got their their large scale biological patterns that still have some semblance of colonial kinds of namings. Totally neotropical, not to like hardly anything but us and I suppose horses, but yeah, knee Arctic. Yeah. So. That's important. Can we change them? Have they been updated? No, there is some in the tropical literature, which I, where I sit in, there's some, there's some pushback to just say, why don't you just say tropical and then say where you are instead, yeah. instead of saying neotropical. Okay. Because there's actually, even within, of course, within the neotropics from 
eastern Brazil to northwestern Costa Rica, there's giant differences in, in um, anyhow. But, okay, let's change it then for next time. Super. But it is not just us. And I love this. I Go. Sorry. No, no, please. No, this is no, really no, no, no. No, Go, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say anything. Neither am I. What? We'll sit here and reflect on the red. Why don't you reflect on the red too? Pangea. <laughs> I think we What's going all on with the red? Sat in yeah. Pangea. Why? First of all, a couple of, like there's a lot going on with the red. First of all, why is it called Antarctic? Next. Yes, yeah, it's Middle Earth if I remember correctly. <laughs> why is it broken up into 3? So what's going on there? We're looking in the chat and we don't see because there's no bears. Because there's no bears. <laughs> uh, it's invaded by zombies, obviously. Amazing. Uh, okay. Right places where penguins are. <laughs> you buy penguins there. there. Yeah, you do actually. Yep. Very good. Okay, yep. so yes, um, they definitely. So let's get over the naming of them and just recognize though that those three places that are on our slide in red. Yeah, thank you, Amadeo. Um, are Part of the same biogeographical region. That's like piece number one that's really important to recognize, right? Why, for example, is uh, the, the southern tip of Africa part of the Antarctic bioregion and not part of the Ethiopian bioregion? Um, so there's a difference there. There's like a, you know, a transition that's really important. And penguins, yes, penguins is Power. one of those things that like unites all of these places. So Antarctic, right? Okay. Super good. So by looking at the distribution of different species, now we're zooming into, uh, North America. Um, we can start to ask questions, right? So just like we did back um, in the biogeographical regions where we've got, um, you know, here we've got uh, the Antarctic, here we've got the Antarctic, and here we've got the Antarctic. We can start to ask questions about what the world was like previously and what life was like previously. Uh, Pangea is definitely the uniting kind of uh, explanation here, which we're not going to like go over with you right now, because that would take like a whole course, which would well, be awesome. Would you say, look, it, it's a puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We're good. Yeah, floating on Although, a lava. Although what I will say is that Buddy who proposed the idea. Oh, like brilliant and uphill battle. Unbelievable resistance. Yeah. Um, in order to in order to get that accepted, um, yeah, it like was... it's on the scale of of, of Anthony von Leeuwenhoek and the, the first person who came up with the with the lenses to have a microscope who said, "Look at all the animalcules in your water," and they're like, "Cuckoo, keep yeah. smoking, Anthony." <laughs> they're like, "Right, right, the land, it's yeah. floating." Sure. sure. <laughs> okay, but so anyway, um, and I I love that people are just like Pangea, right? But like, it took a lot. To yeah. go from from you know that to this, so yeah. yay. Okay, so why are species found where they are? We can look at these patterns and these distributions, and we can make all sorts of inferences. And this is like a monster Easter egg for the topic test um, <laughs> because we can we can look at distribution maps, and we can again like just like with the food webs, make inferences or hypotheses um, about you know the natural history of the species and all of those things, right? Wait. Look at are you saying that to prepare for the topic test, all I have to do is look up all the distributions of all the species? No! And map them? That's not what I'm saying. What <laughs> okay. I'm saying is do this. Yeah. So let's take a look at the hermit warbler. What do we notice about the hermit warbler with respect to its distribution? What can we infer about the hermit warbler? It reads a lot? <laughs> In isolation? No. Oh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Just take a look. Oh, from the map! Oh, yeah. Yeah. What are, what are we going to say? Uh, coastline coastline area, area. That's a good start. But yeah. we've also got a couple of others that are coastal. That's totally fine. Bounded by mountains and other species. Very good. Afraid of socialization. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. What else? It enjoys warm and dry regions near the ocean. It has competitors. Coastal. Is that below the mountain range? Mm -hmm. Lazy. That's a little judgy. <laughs> Wonderful. Overlaps with other species ranges. It does. It yeah. does. Okay. So then if it overlaps with these other two species, the Townsend's warbler and the black-throated gray warbler, 
Um, what might we be able to infer about its niche, or its realized niche, or its fundamental niche? It may share similar characteristics with Townsend's and the black-throated gray. <laughs> access to both niches. That's interesting. Different from, from the, the other two. two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's better. That's yep. better. Doesn't compete with the others. Yeah. Okay. Super good. Yep. Um, there are, so hopefully you'll be able to recognize that there are a lot of things there going on. Now, what might we infer from its evolution? Who might be its sister taxa, for example? See how we're looking at an ecological distribution and we're getting you to try and think tree-based or phylogenetically. Um... Oh, that's good. I like that. Occupies different realized niches, but the same fundamental niche. That's really good. Uh, Townsend's. You think it might have evolved from Townsend's. Okay. Sure. Or black throated, someone else black throated or Townsend speciated. Townsend's, yep. Townsend's, lots that think Townsend's. Townsend's, yep, okay. Me who knows like seven birds. <laughs> yeah, for sure, I getcha. <laughs> okay, yeah, so we can make all sorts of inferences here, right? Now, of course, you're going to need a little more context, a little more kind of a story, right? So, for example, if we said that warblers were really cold adapted species, um, and that their evolution followed a progression of climate change. We might tell you the direction, and you may very well be able to infer which one was like the, if there was, uh, if one of them is a common ancestor, or if there was a common ancestor that led to three due to allopatric, or what's the other one? Sim Sympatric Patrick. speciation, right? So we can add a little bit of information and they can, you can use that to tell the story. And in right? a kind of a, because some of you asked about, could it be an intermediate? So that could be yeah. something, so it could be. Could totally and be a hybrid. So, some of the topic testing that we might give you might suggest, we might suggest that, yeah, the black throated and the gray, uh, the black throated gray and the Townsends have been known to hybridize. Yep. For example. That's right. And that's maybe right. that's. Okay. An explanation of what you're looking at. What the heck is going on with the golden cheek warbler? That cheeky, cheeky warbler. Why? What's going on there? Any ideas? Any hypotheses? So different from the others. Uh, yeah. Needs geographical context of weather and food source. Yeah. Social distancing. distancing. <laughs> Very specific niche. Uh, reduced habitat. Human, Human interference. interference. Very small, realized niche. Very good. Very good. Yep. All of these are testable, right? So we give you, uh, you go out and you collect information or like on a topic test, we'll give you the information and you should be able to, ah. to kind of narrow it down. Thinking right? about biology, maybe it can't fly. So the inferring maybe there's a dispersal limitation. Nice. So thinking about in the distribution of these taxa, their own capacity to move, their own phylogenetic history, and then bringing in the geological history. How, how the game board might have changed. That's right. Somebody here on the screen says ancestors of all other warblers. That is a very interesting hypothesis mm. that I like. Okay. Somehow time has kept on ticking, ticking, ticking. Yeah, we should wrap this up. So let's go through um, a little bit of oh, good scenario. You talk. So there are, in terms of thinking about, as you already have, thinking about using the geology the bio, so how maybe glaciers or plates have shifted on the on the surface of the planet have affected species ranges or, or the ranges of taxa, those red tips on the bottom of the Antarctic region. <clears throat> Thinking about the ecological capacity of different species, how well they can move, are they a big volant thing, or can they does their migratory pattern take them from the South Pole to the North Pole? Or do they just hunker down like a redback salamander and really not move more than a couple of meters a year? Or thinking about, um, and then uh, being approached by a question. And so here is something that the uh, inhabitants of Middle Earth have noted as they have mapped their island and the small, uh, their kind of delightful and relatively small uh, insect fauna of this island. There's a bunch of weevils in New Zealand. 
And they're, these are big, hard-backed things, and people look at them. And the people of the South Island know Hutton Eye as um, it's a seed weevil, and it is known only on the South Island in kind of a patchy uh, stretch down the center, not all the way to the extreme south, and then from Wellington. Wellington's on the North Island. How are you, as a biologist new to Middle Earth, going to explain this? <laughs> what are the hypotheses? What are your hypotheses? I love New Zealand. Well, that's good. That's that keeps great. your job. That's that's your job interview. <laughs> yeah, uh, my cousin, our our cousin, just moved to. Uh, someone has moved around wood. That's an exact yes. So, so it what, could be. What's the like bio speak for that? Of those five hypotheses, what would we call somebody moving wood? Would be an example of human interference. It says on the screen. Travel here, on the boat, firewood. Good. So a word that rhymes with ranch location. <laughs> oh so i i love this so yes. it could be and i didn't even give you before so human translocation so yes. moving of firewood or moving of grains or moving of seeds and then the establishment like our um out the window across the street we have termites yeah. because of that one bit of biology that you would want to know or that you could teach if you were the weevil specialist is that these species don't move a lot. They do not want to fly. They want to hunker down and hide. They move under 100 meters kind of a year, total displacement <laughs> and distance. So um, some people thought rafting. I see in the chat here the idea, Dusham, the two islands were once connected. And Ebusek, New Zealand could have been connected by land in the past. This is a super elegant hypothesis that you need another silo of information for. You need the geologists and the geographers yeah. to tell you about what did New Zealand look like at the last glacial maximum? So just to kind of throw you yeah, the, two words. the eco speak, um, two possible processes, dispersal, uh, either human assisted or otherwise, or vicariance, right? Those are the two of that list of five things, five and, or six things. And Cook Strait is generally, it's it's only about 25 kilometers, but it's it's not a thing that, that insects can do very well at all. No. Okay. So what's the answer? So at the last glacial maximum, uh, or amongst the last glacial maximum, the uh, this, these islands were not shaped as they are today. And so that's kind of an, when we think about bias, how we approach the world. Um, I've often said, like, don't think about the tax of the world seeing the world the way that you do because they smell and taste it. Yeah. And so this is another one. Don't necessarily look at the world as if it looked today like it did then because it didn't. And so Wellington is kind of holding on now as the seas around it have changed because this is what it looked like before. And this likely explains this disjunct distribution. Right. So this is therefore a story of vicariance. There's fans of New Zealand in the Yay. chat. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Fans and family members, it looks like. Wonderful. <laughs> so a story of vicariance. There you go. Okay. So vicariance, yeah. lots and lots of examples of it. But again, we have to kind of wrap our heads around Pangaea mm -hmm. and a whole bunch of other things, right? So we can see how the continents were connected. And then the, what we do is we build up fossil records across those different continents. And we're able to, for example, find evidence of this Triassic land reptile uh, in Africa, in India, and in Antarctica. So large terrestrial reptiles like this in Antarctica are evidence of like one or two, a couple of things. First of all, the land was connected because these are not aquatic reptiles, right? So when you find them in Antarctica, you know that Antarctica was connected to something else. The other thing is by looking at these fossilized ferns here, we can tell quite, quite surely that Antarctica was not as cold as it used to be, right? So not only was it connected, but it was a lot further north than it is now. Um, and you can then start to recreate uh, where these continents were, uh, how quickly they moved, um, and who kind of broke off first. And it's really such a cool area of research that still has lots of opportunity for contribution. 
And I think what we're going to do is we're going to tell you about this next time. Yeah, because I think this is a good story. It's worth telling slowly. Do you want to show the homework question as the week? Let go me show out? you the yeah. homework question. Though we're going to skip all of the human stuff. It is worth telling slowly. And we're coming back to and it. We're coming back to it because it will blow your mind. But let's go through to the homework question. Oh. That and, yeah, we'll, we'll do that we'll later. Okay. Encourage you to read Here's that. your homework. So we'll we'll post the slides with this homework slide, but not with the other ones. Um, and uh, yeah, work through it. It's a bit of math. We have to test numeracy in this course. So this is like you know, kind of encouraging you to think about numeracy and think about adding and subtracting and all of that stuff and graphing and then inferring and interpreting. So it's kind of yeah, it's a pretty it's a pretty next level kind of a kind of a question. Um, and then from that, uh, we have a question for you um, to kind of uh, then get your brain to kind of go to that next step of not just describing this population increase, but what that might mean. So we're kind of guiding you into that application side of things. And there you go. Flans frocation? Yeah, wonderful. With that, we'll say thank you very much. Yeah. Enjoy. We'll see you on Wednesday. Go buy some cheap candy. Okay. It's Bye. on sale. <laughs>